So, uh, as you see from the abstract, there are two parts to my presentation. Uh, firstly, uh, a paper that I should get through in 40 minutes, and secondly, and more importantly, a video that will last 20 minutes. Um, the video is less polished than the paper because of technical problems that always come up. Um, but what it makes, uh, I mean, what it loses in polish, it makes up for in freshness because I finished it last about uh, six hours ago. <laughs> um, so, uh, but, but good to have its debut rough as it is uh, in this beautiful sepulchre. Uh, but ultimately, I think the video, once it's done properly, will be the more important contribution uh, to the topic of soul and nature. That cloud there, that mountain, what is real about those? Try taking away the phantasm and the entire human contribution, you sober realist. Yes, if only you could do that. If you could forget your heritage, your past and training, your entire humanity and animality. For us, there is no reality, nor for you either, you sober ones. I think that is, yeah, are we not hearing some feedback or? Yeah, yeah. Yes, oh, okay, just that done. Nietzsche is saying to the realists, then, that it's impossible to extract from our current awareness the sedimentations accumulated over millennia of previous animal as well as cultural experience. Impossible to escape the ways in which some fantasy, some prejudice, some unreason, some ignorance, some fear, and who knows what else, have woven their way into our every feeling and sense impression and especially, it appears, when it comes to our experience of the natural world. However, one also finds passages in Nietzsche's work, uh, works suggesting that it may, after all, be possible to check that ancient positing, perhaps through some kind of phenomenological epoche, and let natural phenomena, like clouds and mountains, simply show themselves from themselves, perhaps even as they are in themselves. But if this were possible, what would it be like? How would nature look then? Behind these questions is for me a practical concern with the relentless devastation of the natural world. One reason I think it's so difficult to persuade people in the developed countries to care about the ongoing destruction of the planet and its climate is that they have so little direct experience of natural phenomena, given the extent to which contemporary urban life enables us to insulate ourselves from them. It would surely be helpful if one could escape or subvert the social construction of the natural world that some theorists claim must always condition our experience in order to get back to the things of nature themselves. Nietzsche's talk of the possibility of our experiencing the natural world as de-anthropomorphized, de-divinized, or newly redeemed prompts the question of exactly what we would encounter under such circumstances. The short answer, will to power, requires some elaboration as to the methods whereby one might effect such a transformation of one's experience. To this end, I draw on some ideas and techniques from Taoist and Zen Buddhist philosophy. The results allow us to see that the way to respond to Nietzsche's exhortation through the person of Zarathustra to stay true to the earth is to cleanse our experience of all the egocentric clutter that gets in the way of seeing what the Buddhists call our true nature, as well as the nature of the world around us. One does this by getting rid of consciousness, which Nietzsche calls not only superficial, but ultimately superfluous. And the language associated, I'm sorry, to do away with consciousness, and the language associated with and supportive of such consciousness. This undertaking does not preclude, but rather prompts a shift to a different kind of language that encourages behavior, that conduces to more fulfilling lives, and perhaps even to saving the planet. So, very modest aims this morning. As a way of showing the power of collective constructions of the natural world, Nietzsche emphasizes in Human All to Human the vast difference between ancient and modern forms of this process. 
he discusses the relations of the first humans to nature in connection with the origin of the religious cult. Quote, the whole of nature is for those early religionists a sum of activities of conscious and volitional beings, an enormous complex of arbitrariness. This complex for Nietzsche lacks any kind of natural causality, but is rather infused with unpredictable wills, magical forces, demons and gods, and inspirited things, all of which might be controlled or compelled through affection, or if that doesn't work, through sorcery. A life in which, quoting again, things, nature, tools, possessions of any kind, were animate and ensouled, capable of injuring and evading human purposes, gave rise to an extraordinary feeling of impotence on the part of human agents. Such a lack of power eventually engendered desire for the opposite, for a feeling of power. And this was later granted when Western science formulated laws of nature which enabled people to exercise unprecedented power over the natural world with a vengeance by means of increasingly sophisticated technologies. Modern humans, for Nietzsche, tend to be impressed, by contrast, by the uniformity of the laws of nature, understood as utterly impersonal and completely devoid of irrational spirits. He suggests that this uniformity derives from a change in the notion of the subject, which is now richer and more polyphonic than before, such that the uniformity comes to some extent from a projection of human desires. Although most early societies practiced various kinds of ritual ceremonies and magic in order to ensure success in the hunt or for agriculture, it was also clearly advantageous for our ancestors, especially when they were hunters and gatherers, to gain an accurate understanding of natural processes. But, Nietzsche points out, on grounds that we would today call evolutionary biological, that looseness in drawing certain kinds of conclusions also had considerable advantages. Quoting from uh, The Joyful Science, whoever, for example, didn't know how to find the similar often enough in the context of food or dangerous animals, whoever subsumed too slowly or too carefully would have a smaller probability of surviving than one who immediately assumed sameness in the case of mere similarities. So these reddish berries, for example, may not be quite the same color as those which my gathering companions so greedily devoured yesterday, just an hour before the stomach convulsion set in, which killed him with gruesome rapidity. But they're similar enough in appearance for me to think twice about eating them. And that slight rustling sound isn't quite the same as the sound I heard the day before, just seconds before the saber-toothed tiger leapt upon my hunting companion and devoured him but it sounds close enough for me to look for the nearest tree to climb to a height beyond the range of a tiger's upward leap. In order then for certain kinds of practical reasoning to take hold, it was necessary, Nietzsche continues, for a long time not to see or feel what is changing about things. Beings that didn't see precisely had an advantage over those who saw everything in flux. In and for itself, every high level of carefulness in drawing conclusions, every tendency towards skepticism in this, in this regard, posed a great danger for life. So, to get on more efficiently with the business of living, it's better not to pay too close attention to what is really going on. Nietzsche draws the analogy with the process of reading. Just as a reader skims quickly over the individual words on a page, this is from Beyond Good and Evil, so we scarcely see a tree exactly and completely with regard to its leaves, branches, color, shape. It's so much easier for us to fantasize an approximation of a tree. Even in the midst of the strangest experiences, we still do the same thing. We make up the greater part of the experience. But this passage also suggests that we might be able to train ourselves to do what is less easy than fantasizing the bulk of our experience. Namely, to see through, as it were, the persistent web of concepts and categories and linguistic labels to what is simply there. 
Given the survival value that attaches to the tendency to fantasize approximations of things, the strategy would be to suspend this feature of what phenomenologists call the natural attitude, thereby affecting a switch from one, what, what one might call a life perspective to a death perspective. In an aphorism titled Midday in the Wanderer and His Shadow, Nietzsche writes of how a strange longing for repose can overwhelm the soul of one who has reached the noontide of life. Quoting from that passage, upon a meadow hidden among the woods, he sees the great god Pan asleep. All the things of nature have fallen asleep with him, an expression of eternity on their faces. He wants nothing, he frets about nothing. His heart stands still, only his eyes are alive. It is a death with open eyes. Then the man sees much that he has never seen before, and for as far as he can see, everything is spun into a net of light and, as it were, buried in it. In an unpublished note, Nietzsche calls this condition a means of procuring the advantages of one who is dead. This condition tends not to be appreciated because of what he refers to as a fundamentally false evaluation of the dead world on the part of the sentient world. That note goes on. The dead world, eternally in motion and without erring, force against force. It is a festival to go from this world across to the dead world. Let us see through this comedy of sentient being and thereby enjoy it. Let us not think of the return to the inanimate as a regression. We become quite true thereby. We perfect ourselves. Death has to be reinterpreted. We thereby reconcile ourselves with what is actual, with the dead world. For Nietzsche, this is also a way of getting beyond the human all too human. He writes, to think, of, to think oneself a way out of humanity, to unlearn desires of all kinds, and to employ the entire abundance of one po one's powers in looking. And yet, what often happens, I'm going to skip this piece. A few years later, in 1881, Nietzsche elaborates these ideas in a series of passages in his notebooks. He praises the will to know things as they are. For this, he writes, what is needed is practice in seeing with other eyes, practice in seeing apart from human relations, and thus seeing objectively, zachli, to cure this enormous delusion of human beings. Shortly after this, he presents a somewhat contrasting view. The task, to see things as they are. The means, to be able to see with a hundred eyes, from many persons. It was a mistake to emphasize the impersonal and to character characterize seeing with the eye of one's neighbor as moral. To see from the viewpoint of many neighbors and with purely personal eyes, that is the right thing. But there needn't be a contradiction here, as we can see if we move to the uh, East Asian tradition, and I'll begin with some brief remarks about the classical Chinese <coughs> and how they look at this idea of seeing with the eyes of many neighbors, and the neighbors aren't just fellow humans either. Confucius, for example, advocates the cultivation of reciprocal perspectives, putting oneself in the other person's position, or seeing the situation from the other person's point of view as a way of reducing self-centeredness and promoting social harmony. Not long after Confucius, the classical Taoist thinkers, and Zhuangzi in particular, recommend expanding the practice of experiential reciprocity beyond human beings to animals, birds, fishes, and even trees. Zhuangzi famously likens our normal anthropocentric perspective to the situation of a frog at the bottom of a well who believes that he commands a view of the entire world. Some 15 years, uh, sorry, some 1500 years after Zhuangzi in Japan, the Zen master Gogen similarly recommends going beyond what he calls looking through a bamboo tube at a corner of the sky by entertaining the perspective, the perspectives of an even broader range of beings. I quote, dragons, hungry ghosts, 
celestial beings, mountains, and drops of water. For Nietzsche, this kind of understanding came easily in the Western tradition too, at least in the old days. Quoting from Dawn of Morning, during the great prehistoric age of humanity, one presupposed spirit everywhere and never thought to honor it as a privilege of the human being. There was thus no shame attached to being descended from animals or trees, and one saw spirit as that which connected us to the natural world rather than that which separates us from it. Such a view is still possible in the modern age, at least for someone like Nietzsche, who writes in an aphorism with the title Nature as Doppelgänger, that the ultimate joy is found in being able to say of one's physical environment, this nature is intimate and familiar to me, related by blood, and even more than that. But what does he mean by saying that the landscape of the upper Engadin is related to him even more than by blood? Well, for one thing, from the death perspective mentioned earlier, he appreciates the contribution to our lives that comes from the inorganic realm. Quoting from a note of, uh, the 18, 18, of 1881, the inorganic conditions us through and through. Water, air, earth, the shape of the ground. How distant and superior is our attitude towards what is dead, the anorganic. And all the while, we are three quarters water and have anorganic minerals in us that perhaps do more for our well and ill-being than the whole of living society. Nietzsche was fascinated by what he knew, which was quite a lot, about the biology of his day. But he would have been truly delighted had he been capable of registering it at the discovery by Carl Bender in 1897 of mitochondria. Mitochondria are organelles that reside within all cells in the human body and generate the, the energy necessary for the cell's activities and the body's life. There are some 10 million billion mitochondria in the body of the average adult, and they constitute almost half its dry weight, which is what remains after all the H2O is extracted. What is remarkable, however, about the mitochondria is that their DNA is quite different from the DNA of the body's own cells, and quite similar to the DNA of the mitochondria that power the cells of all multicellular, or multicellular organisms, whether animals or plants. One implication of this is that if I attempt to assert my identity by pointing here to myself, to my body, saying, this is me, well, two-thirds of what I'm pointing to is water and almost half the rest consists of mitochondria, which are very definitely not me. And it's this substantial not me in the form of mitochondrial DNA, even more than blood, that relates my body physically to all other living bodies. For Nietzsche, if one is going to understand the natural world properly, and aside from the various human projections onto it, an appropriate research method is called for from the joyful science. As a researcher into nature, one should get out of one's human corner and thereby realize that what reigns in nature is abundance, extravagance, in accordance with the will to power, which is precisely the will of life. One factor that allows us to get out of our human corner would be our intimate mitochondrial relationship to the natural world on the basis of which we can learn to entertain the perspectives of any other life form. In the fifth book of The Joyful Science, Nietzsche offers this advice to the natural scientists of his day. Above all, one should not want to divest existence of its polysemic character. That, what <clears throat> that is what good taste demands, gentlemen. The taste of reverence in the face of everything that goes beyond your horizon. And in the next aphorism, Our New Infinite, he goes on to argue that the human intellect, being perspectival in, at first in its view of itself and the world, is incapable of determining, quote, how far the perspectival character of existence reaches, or whether it even has any other character, whether an existent lacking interpretation loses its sense to the point of becoming nonsense, whether, on the contrary, 
all existence is not essentially existence that interprets. Alles Dasein ist Interpretierendes. Leaving aside the question of whether something other than the intellect may be capable of determining such a thing, Nietzsche continues, but I do think that today at least we are far enough, we are far from the laughable immodesty of decreeing from our own little corner that it is permissible to have perspectives only from this corner. Rather, the world has become infinite for us again, insofar as we cannot dismiss the possibility that it includes within itself an infinity of interpretations. Not only multiple interpretations then from each human being, but also from all other living, and ultimately, as we'll see, non-living beings. You could call this panpsychism. this from another angle, from the angle of what Nietzsche calls the drives, die Triebe. <clears throat> One of his most important statements about the drives makes the remarkable claim, largely ignored by the secondary literature, that the forces driving our psychical life do so with almost no awareness on our part, from dawn of morning. However far we may drive our self-knowledge, nothing can be more incomplete than the picture we have of the totality of drives that constitute our being. We can scarcely even name the cruder ones, their number and strength, their ebb and flood, their play and counterplay, and above all, the laws of their nourishment remain quite unknown to us. Whether we are awake or dreaming, Nietzsche continues, our, our drives do nothing other than interpret nerve impulses and posit causes for them according to their own needs. Since the patterns of stimulation received by the body during sleep are minimal, the drives have much more freedom, freedom of interpretation in their imagining, hence the fantastic nature of the dream. They are more constrained while we are awake and active, since the patterns of neural stimulation then are much denser. But Nietzsche emphasizes that, quote, there is no essential difference between waking and dreaming. Insofar as the drives continue their interpretations during the day, dreaming and fantasizing occasions for their own fulfillment. So, insofar as all existence interprets, and the drives in particular interpret, and will to power interprets, so that interpretation is itself a form of will to power, this gives us the picture Nietzsche proposes in Beyond Good and Evil 36 of the world as will to power and nothing besides. There, on the basis of the assumption that we can't get to any other reality other, other than the reality of our drives, he asks, is it not permitted to make the experiment and ask the question whether this given doesn't suffice for understanding, on the basis of things like itself, the so-called mechanistic or material world as well, as a kind of drive life in which organic functions are still synthetically bound up with each other as a preform of life. It surely is permitted to make that experiment, and the results will be the realization that as the drives interpretively, interpretively project our waking world, what they encounter is will to power. As Nietzsche puts it, will can of course work only on will and not on matter, on nerves for example. Thus, the drives encounter will in the form of other interpreting drives, not only those of our fellow human beings, but also the drives that animate animals, plants, and all other natural phenomena. So, what is ultimately going on, according to Nietzsche, if we manage to de-anthropomorphize the natural world and naturalize ourselves, as he puts it, with pure, newfound, newly redeemed nature? Nietzsche doesn't elaborate, but it's helpful to consider here the traditional East Asian practice of what they call emptying the heart-mind. This is referred to by the, both the classical Taoist thinkers and followed to this day by Chan and Zen Buddhist practitioners, all of whom are engaged in a similar enterprise. As one simply sits in the prescribed upright posture, following the inhalations and exhalations of one's breathing, over time, the internal dialogue, 
the incessant conversations and commentaries, thoughts and feelings, <coughs> memories and fantasies, fears and anticipations that occupy our minds for so much of our waking lives, gradually quietens down. What supervenes is a calm openness and clarity. The Taoist and Buddhist thinkers account for this in terms of a falling away of the conceptual frameworks, ingrained thought patterns and emotional overlays and underpinnings that usually condition and so preclude our immediate experience of what is going on. Along with this comes a fading of the egocentric self that is generating all of this psychical clutter. Nietzsche describes this kind of self as, from dawn of morning, a phantom of ego, which for most people has been formed in the heads of those around them and then communicated back to them, as a result of which they all live together in a fog of impersonal and semi-personal opinions and arbitrary, almost po poetical evalu evaluations, each one in the head of the other and this head in other heads again. A wondrous world of phantasms. This fog of opinions and habits grows and thrives more or less independently of the people it envelops. The Buddhists call this karma. This general pale fiction of the ego, as Nietzsche calls it, has internal as well as external origins, insofar as it also de derives from the plurality of the drives. A note from the same time as that passage from Dawn of Morning reads as follows. The I is not the attitude of one being to several, drives, thoughts, and so on, but the ego is a plurality of person-like forces, of which now this one, now that one, stands in the foreground as ego and regards others as a subject, regards an influential and determining external world. As the drives are in conflict, the feeling of the I is always strongest precisely where the preponderance is. Human reason, according to Twilight of the Idols, quote, believes in the I, in the I as being and as substance, and projects its belief in the I substance onto all things, thereby creating the concept of thing. But when this belief in the I is undermined, the concept of the thing is correspondingly weakened, and what comes to the fore uh, <clears throat> as substance recedes is relationships, just as the Buddhists teach. As we free ourselves from what Nietzsche calls the error of the I, we come to recognize, quote, the affinities, the Verwandtschaften, and antagonisms among things, multiplicities, therefore, and their laws. This corresponds perfectly to the idea of no self, which is basic to Buddhism, and it applies equally to the I and to things and dissolves them all into a network of relationships. So the practice of meditation has one simply sit, waiting for the words to subside and the language to decline and fall away together. Not something one can do when driven by the instinct for self-preservation, but rather in some temporary disengagement from the business of making a living in society. When this is working, a field opens up that can remain through rising from the meditation cushion and returning to the opposite pole of full dynamic activity. With a diminishing of the thoughts flow and a falling silent of language comes a dying down of consciousness, which is, for Nietzsche in any case, as we saw, something that is for the most part superfluous. I'm going to quote from the passage that Larry uh, discussed at length yesterday, but I don't think you quoted this part. The human being, like every living being, is thinking constantly, but without knowing it. The thinking that becomes conscious is only the smallest part, the su most superficial and the worst part. For it is only this conscious thinking that takes place in words, in signs that communicate. Our thoughts are constantly generalized by the character of consciousness and translated into the perspective of the herd. An increase in consciousness is thus a danger, and whoever lives among the conscious Europeans knows that it is even an illness. A less sick way to live, then, would be to let the drives that give rise to our everyday consciousness and its thinking in words become quiescent, no longer interpreting the situation from their own perspectives, and to thereby allow what is going on beneath thinking to flow through the body in silence and without commentary. 
What's going on is basically drives, not exfoliating into consciousness or commenting on the text of experience, not the egocentric drives that keep the illusion of the I going, but now only the more ancient, deeper level drives that through millennia of adaptation have kept the human body attuned to its physical environment. Paradoxically, it's by putting ourselves in a situation where we don't need to be concerned with preserving ourselves that we can get to a condition in which it is only those original, natural, environmental, environment-related and life-preserving drives that are operative. Under such conditions, one's responses to the world are naturally spontaneous, and one's actions stem not from the narrow confines of the small self, but from the forces of heaven and earth as they operate through the well-trained body and its great reason. One thinks of Nietzsche's praise of Goethe in Twilight of the Idols. Goethe conceived of a strong, highly cultured human being, adept in a range of physical skills, lively chitin, self-controlled and with reverence for himself, who can dare to grant himself the full range and richness of naturalness, and who is strong enough for this freedom. And whatever thoughts may come when the chatter of consciousness had quietened down will then be genuinely results of Nietzsche's famous es denkt rather than mere opinions of the egocentric self. But since Nietzsche apparently didn't engage in any formal meditation practice, how did he arrive at such experiences and ideas, such ideas so, that are so similar to Buddhism and Taoism? <coughs> Well, he arrived there by walking, or as he often puts it, marchion, marching, six to eight hours a day. One can still the body's locomotions by sitting and following the breath, or else one can put it into energetically sustained movement by walking or running or climbing or swimming. When Nietzsche was in the Engadin and hiking the paths around Sils Maria, he kept to the well-trodden ones, avoiding dangerous terrain in which he would have to slow down and pay attention to where he was putting his feet. Many of his letters express gratitude for the successful efforts of the local Kurverein to keep the paths around town smooth and even and clear of obstructions so that he could march along them without any fear of stumbling. By keeping to safe and secure paths, whether around Sils Maria or among the lanes of Venice or the streets of Genoa, Nietzsche was able to practice a vigorous form of walking meditation, known as Kinghi in the Zen tradition, that allowed him to hear the innermost voices of his thoughts rather than the superficial chatter of his eye. No wonder, he reports, that his creativity was always at its highest when the muscles were working at, its, at their most supple pitch, such that the body is experienced not as recalcitrant matter, but as energetic flow. One can also, under these, it's clear, at least it's clear to me, that by means of his marching, Nietzsche be became able to see what was going on around him. Insofar as this description of learning to see from Twilight of the Idols could certainly have been written in different language by a Taoist sage or a Zen master. To learn seeing, to accustom the eye to resting, patience, letting things approach, to postpone judgment, learning to go around and comprehend each unique case from all sides. That is the first preschooling in spirituality. Not to react to a stimulus immediately, but to get hold of the instincts that inhibit and check. To learn seeing, as I understand it, is almost what the unphilosophical way of speaking calls a strong will. But the essential thing here is precisely not to will, to be able to defer decision. To conclude with a return to the things of nature, how are things then when the body flow is fully and vibrantly underway? The language of Zarathustra is helpful here. Redeemed from their bondage under purpose, the things of nature dance on the feet of chance, and above each one, the heaven accident, the heaven innocence, the heaven contingency, the heaven exuberance. Zarathustra's gnarled tree at midday, wound round by the love of the vine. 
the world become perfect, and we ourselves falling still into the well of eternity, up into the abyss of the heavens, from whence soul falls as dew, baptizing all things in the vast, incessant process of earthly becoming.